All right, controls. This is a topic that we typically think of in the context of security, but we certainly want to think of it from an identity management and governance perspective. So I, I hope this provides some um, uh, enlightenment in terms of how you can communicate with those in your security organizations, or if you're here from a uh, risk and compliance or security perspective, you can understand better how uh, you can really ask the identity organization to support what, what you're trying to accomplish as well. So I've already used this graphic, but just to, to remind everyone, about two-thirds of the attacks last year involved compromised credentials. And so it's definitely worth considering how can we uh, put controls in place to try to mitigate that, but also try to uh, prevent, not only prevent, but to detect and correct that as well. If users are really a security concern, then what role should identity management and governance play? So before we address that question, just to level set what, what I mean by identity management and governance, let's look at the timeline. This started with this idea of we would provision identities, right? We were gonna do zero day start stop, meaning that those users as they joined the organization were immediately effective in, in getting to, to the things that they needed to do their jobs right, that made them efficient. And whenever someone left the organization, we would immediately revoke their access to reduce risk for us. And that evolved into this idea of identity lifecycle management. We were going to not only just deal with joiners and leavers, but the movers as well, because things change all the time in our organizations. Projects in, people change roles, and so forth. But you know, that kind of fell victim to this idea that we ought to try to automate too much, perhaps. We tried to connect into too many systems, and it, in some cases, it really doesn't make sense to automate the fulfillment or provisioning portion of that. So the industry sort of shifted towards this idea of we would focus on access certifications, and we would use the certification process to really determine who should have access to what and whether that was proper or not, and, and use that to drive the access revocations. It's also known as attestation or access reviews really driven by compliance efforts and regulations. And then that broadened into the sense of identity governance. Uh, not only would we do it from a compliance perspective, but we would also put some governance type of controls around identity uh, and make sure that the review and certification process supported not just compliance, but also the ability to, to control who had access to what. The analysts, in their infinite wisdom, decided that these two markets should converge, and they determined that it should be named something that's, in my opinion, not the best name, but identity governance and administration is what Gartner calls it. Forrester just recently uh, released a WAVE report. They're calling it identity management and governance, which I personally like better, but for the sake of the rest of this presentation, we'll just call it IGA. Agreed? Identity governance and administration. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, back to the idea of controls, there are insecurity, preventive, detective, and corrective controls. And it's pretty self-explanatory what they mean, but we want to keep breaches from occurring with preventive. We want to identify what potential vulnerabilities exist in our systems as well as what methods of attack might be used and be able to put in place de detective uh, controls for those. And then as we detect those, we want to put in place corrective controls to respond. So what would that look like in the context of identity governance and administration? Well, from a preventive pr perspective, identity management is all about minimizing access rights, which of course is something that's required by the principle of least privilege, which is in many of the regulations that we see today, but it's a good security practice nonetheless, regardless of what sort of uh, regulations that you might be required to submit to. From a detective perspective, we often don't think of identity governance or identity management in the context of detective controls, but really the whole process of access certification is a detective control. We're detecting access rights that are inappropriate. So why not consider that as part of our security process as well? And then finally, from a corrective perspective, it's we detect inappropriate access rights, and we want to revoke those and make sure that it happens. And oftentimes, when we're very focused on certifications, when we're very focused on compliance, the idea of the corrective control is somewhat of an afterthought. We don't 
really know for sure that those access rights are being revoked. We don't put as much effort and attention into that. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So if we had all those things in place, then everything would be perfect, and none of us would have to be here. We'd all be blissfully enjoying our very secure environments, but we know that's not the case. There's really, the way that IGA is performed today and the observations that I've made with, with our customers is they're struggling with three shortcomings that need to be improved upon. So let's talk about that. The first one is the apathy of the business. You know, we've sort of outsourced risk to a bunch of people who neither care nor understand risk by putting certification into the hands of the line of business managers uh, they, they look at it as administrative overhead. It feels like something that's being inflicted upon them. They don't really understand it. We don't really give them much guidance about why we're doing this or how to make good decisions around who should have access to what. And so what do they do? They, they rubber stamp or they resist participating in the process until the last minute. And they don't put much thought into it. The second shortcoming is this tunnel vision on compliance that I've already alluded to. But, and of course we all know that we shouldn't do compliance for compliance sake, that it should be an, an outcome of good security. I'm sure we've all heard that before. But again, we, this, I've made this case already that if we're focused on compliance, then the whole idea of revocation or that corrective control, we don't pay that much attention to it. And what's the point of doing a certification if we're not accurately revoking access when the certification determines that it needs to be done? And finally, we do certifications often on a six-month basis. Some organizations do it more often, some even as often as annually. But what happens in between the certifications? So far, that's been okay because we haven't really relied upon access governance or identity governance to be a, a real security control. But if we want to be better participants in the security outcomes of our organization, then we have to start thinking of things not in six month or one year increments. It needs to be far more real time than that. So what I'd like to propose to you today is a four step model that will give you controls associated with identity governance and administration. And we're gonna start on the left side here and then work our way around clockwise by establishing an identity and entitlement catalog. None of this will seem all that revolutionary, but when you put it all together, it actually can become quite powerful. This really is the first step, and what we're trying to do with this one is gaining visibility into who has access to what. It's really that, that foundational. The problem is, is that who are your users? There was a time where we could just rely on having our employees covered, and that was enough, and then contractors, and now partners, and now we're talking about customers as we do digital transformation or business transformation, and even things as we start thinking about an identity of things associated to the internet of things. Some organizations are doing that. We've got a customer in New Zealand that uh, is, is using identity management for their sheep, and <laughs> there's a there's a, another place that's using it for a SIM. There's a, a mobile provider in South Africa that's using it for their SIM cards for 47 million users. Uh, there's, there's another one that's doing it with uh, fire engines and, and the equipment on a fire truck, right? So, I mean, it, there's, there's all these great examples of using identity to also uh, track where things are and what they're doing, how they're being used, and so on. And so what that means is we need to have uh, a single source of truth, a single source of identity, and we need to have an attribute authority. Now, that term attribute has become more popular, but it's one that, that we focused on from the very beginning. We believe that it's not just about the identity and in some cases roles where a lot of the focus has been, because a role is really just one type of attribute. What's, what's your job title? What, what do you do? That's a role. Well, we also are interested in what time of day do you normally work? What are your working hours? Where do you work from? Are you a, an employee who travels? And therefore, we want to consider where you are in the world. That might change from time to time uh, in terms of, of those attributes. So there's all these other additional attributes that we can leverage in what's sometimes referred to as attribute-based access control um, as opposed to role-based access control, which is where a lot of the focus has been previously. But we have to have this information to start with. And we have to know the interrelationships between these things. 
but not just the who, the what. And again, the what has gotten more complex as well with the introduction of cloud services that aren't under our authority. Um, so we need some, again, an authoritative source of what's in the environment, uh, and it must be comprehensive, and it also must reflect business context, meaning is it used as something that's critical to the business? Is it something that is, uh, what's, what's the sort of SLAs around it? Uh, so what sort, sort of risk is involved? What sort of cost is involved in that platform? Um, who are the, the important business constituents? And so on. This is important information in the what. Again, attributes matter, and it's something that we need to, to focus more on. And we put all that together, and it's a big spaghetti mess of who has access to what. Um, and if we were to try to draw it out, it would, it would look quite complex. But that's where the, the systems come into play that have the ability to, um, to associate the, the who with the what as, along with their attributes, including business context. If we do that right, then we'll have a core set of identities. We'll know what relationships they have to our organization. We will eliminate those improper updates that come from non-authoritative attribute sources. And it gives us an ability to scale as we determine, especially as, as we get involved with extending access to uh, not just employees, but to, to even our customers. Uh, Martin Kupinger, if, if you follow Kupinger Cole, um, he's, he's, I know Gartner and Forrester are popular, but he's a, an analyst in Germany uh, that I find uh, probably a little bit better on the identity side than some of the other ones. And he had a great blog the other day. He said, there is no such thing as consumer IAM. We've all heard that term, CIAM. It's like the next big way we want to do uh, digital business enablement. But I thought that was interesting. And the reason why is because every system you have that could be accessed by a customer or a consumer must also be accessed by an employee or a contractor, someone internal to your organization, to perform administrative tasks and operational tasks. And if you're managing identity to those systems or applications with two different platforms, now you've set yourself up for risk. So why not manage it all from a single platform? That was the case that he made. So we, we need that scalability to be able to address that. And as I've already mentioned, we, it needs to be updated in near real time. We live in a real time risk world. We need real time attribute authority. All right, that's step one, the identity entitlement catalog. Let's move on to a maintainable IGA model. And what do I mean by that? Well, we know who has access to what in the first step but should they? How do we answer that question? So building a maintainable IGA model involves input from the business, of course, because they're the ones who really understand what projects are in place and how that's being utilized. So we have to pull that information from the business. We have to turn that into policy as well, based on not only what's important in the business, but regulations and security policies. So we need some way to capture that and hopefully build attributes around that. Risk scoring would be very useful here because if we know what's highest risk, we can focus on those areas, de-emphasize areas that don't require as much focus. And of course, we need to have controls and constraints around uh, what's happening in the environment, be able to detect things that are abnormal and remediate those issues. Again, because we're talking about controls here, it's, it's uh, detective and corrective controls to go along with preventive. So some examples here. We're all familiar with business roles. Uh, you're probably already using them. But beyond the role, beyond a, a job code, or beyond the title of those users, what if we had information about whether that employee was full-time or part-time, or worked business hours or after hours, or was a traveling employee, or one that, that only worked in, a, in an office setting? Those, all of those attributes could help us as we try to focus in on, on things that are exceptions to the rule. And that's really the next step, is to focus on the exceptions. And that will improve our efficiency. So when we do things like, when, when a business user asks for access to a thing make, during the, the request and approval process, well, we may want to automate the approval for things that are uh, normal for that particular role or for that, that, those particular attributes. But we also want to uh, question that whenever it's an exception to the rule. Risk scoring, as I mentioned, we can use kind of a red, yellow, green, red, amber, green approach to this thing. Uh, we can prioritize things like access review. So our, our business users, when we ask them to certify access, instead of just giving them a list that has no 
priority at all. Let's put at the top of the list those things that indicate the highest risk. And that might be because of the type of asset that or application is, is particularly sensitive. It might be because that user has exhibited some sort of risky behavior, and that's information we want to feed into all of that certification. We can also use it to gauge the effectiveness of our governance program because we can see is, is risk increasing or decreasing? Where is risk increasing or decreasing? Where should we focus efforts on improvement? It would, uh, it would not be good to ignore the most common control, which is sep separation of duties. And of course, we need to collect separation of duties, uh, policies, we need to enforce those. But we also want to make sure that where there are exceptions, that we have time constraints on those and that we revoke uh, any, uh, any exceptions that have been put into place. We also want to look at orphan accounts, so we need policies around that. What, what constitutes an orphan account? Is it because somebody hasn't used their access in a year? Is it six months? Well, it depends on your organization. So you need to define orphan accounts and you need to have some way to flag those, especially for the line of business managers as they're certifying access. All right, so if we put into place this model-based approach, we want, the main goal here is to enable the business to interact better around this and provide the information that they have, make it more manageable and maintainable so that every policy is not a one-off. We put in place policies that can then automate the, the flagging of things that are, are high risk or a priority that we need to focus on. All right, third step, a business-driven IGA. And I've already spoken some about involving the business, but if we want to really engage with our business, their experience had better be very, very good because otherwise they're gonna see it and they're just not gonna participate. So that means, of course, a, a nice, clean user interface, user experience, uh, but also give them information that they need, that they want. They might be curious, what could I have access to? Well, let's give them a list of that because it's something that they can use to improve the work that they do if they have access to tools that they might need that they didn't even know about. Maybe they'll stop going around IT to shadow IT if they actually know what they, they could access internally. Do we need to make approvals for everything or can we automate certain approvals based on policy? And who needs to approve it? A lot of times users request access to something, maybe it goes to a ticketing system and then it kind of falls into a black hole and the users don't have any idea, when am I going to get access to this thing? I mean, they're used to going to the, you know, the Play Store or, or uh, to, the, to the App Store and having immediate access to things. And now suddenly, you know, we're going to make them wait a day, a week, two weeks, I've seen, uh, to, to get access to things. That's, that's not very business user friendly. From a certification perspective, it's kind of the same story. Again, we have to have a great UI. But we also want to give them those priorities I've already been speaking about, priorities around using risk scoring um, and information highlighted that allows them to see what exceptions are in place and really focus on the things that are most relevant. We talk about fulfillment or provisioning, and sometimes it's, it's a four-letter word. It's kind of a dirty word, but the reality is, is that there should be an adaptable approach. There's no one-size-fits-all. Different applications should require different methods of fulfillment. So whether that's through an integration with a ticketing system that says, all right, administrator, please provide access to the system for this user, or it might be through automated provisioning for applications that are related to the entire environment, maybe you know, large enterprise apps like SAP or something like that. It may make sense to do some integration and do automated provisioning. Uh, we might, it might be an application that very few users use, and so it's simply just a case of emailing the administrator and having that taken care of that way. Of course, we're dealing with a world where we have federation, we have cloud services, and so we also want to look at integration methods uh, via standards as well. But it's not enough to just drop off the request and hope that it gets fulfilled. So we also have to have a method of closing a loop whenever a user requests something. Uh, so that means that, or it could be revocations as well, whenever we do an access certification. So we have to compare user access continuously against the fulfillment requests. And if there is a mismatch, then we raise what's sometimes referred to as an audit case. Not to be confused with auditors, but this is an audit case to say, 
there's a, there's a mismatch between what's been requested and what's actually in the systems. And then finally, our, uh, our auditor friends, not to be forgotten, are going to be looking for specific reports. So to the extent that we can provide them with some out-of-the-box uh, reports that, that satisfy what they're looking for and get them to move on to something else, we'll, we'll do that. So that includes things like separation of duties. That'll be a, a clear one that they're looking for. We also need ad hoc reporting. There are times that uh, we need some specific things that come up, and so we'll be looking for that as well. All right, so putting that all together, if we have this a business-driven approach to IGA, it means that we have to have an intuitive experience for our business users, keep them engaged, give them the appropriate data that they need, close the loop so that no black holes for requests when they come through or certifications, and that we uh, are addressing the auditor concerns with a minimal amount of effort as well. Finally, analytics. Uh, you heard about it a little bit earlier in one of the presentations, and pretty much all of uh, my vendor friends in the industry are focusing on analytics, so I thought I'd, I'd give you our perspective on what identity analytics means. We are building identity analytics into our product. It's not going to be a standalone engine that you have to license and, and then uh, try to bolt on to an, an existing implementation. We want it to be, we're not building analytics for the sake of analytics. We want it to improve the experience of users and reduce risk for organizations. So I'll, I'll show you our approach here in a moment. The question we're trying to address here is how can we make business users more effective, engage them more efficiently, and at the same time reduce risk in the organization? That's the priorities that we have for our analytics. So the first approach is contextual decision support. So when we say analytics, what we're talking about is machine learning. We build a baseline of what's normal activity, and then when it's abnormal, we flag it, right? So we raise a risk score as a result, and we provide contextual information about this particular user. So does this user have access that mismatches other people with the same roles or attributes? Has this user not used his access in over a year and suddenly now is using it a lot. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, we don't know. But when we ask the line of business manager, we can provide some of this context that will help that individual make a better decision around whether that access is appropriate or not. Analytics is also very useful from a continuous improvement perspective. So we think about the sort of metrics and KPIs that we can reveal. We can look at trends. We can look at things like, are risk scores going up or down? Are they going up and down for specific parts of our business? Uh, we might look at things like revocation rates. So in an organization that just recently went through an acquisition, and perhaps there's a reduction in force as a result, we might see both a spike in users from the new, the new organization coming in, that, that gain access, but then we might also see a spike in revocation of access. Does that match the reality of what we're seeing in our systems or not? That's, that's important to know. As we see these trends, it helps us become more efficient and drive down risk. Now, as we detect events and behaviors that should raise concern, what we're talking about is a greater integration with the security tools that many of us already have in our environment. Uh, many of us already have SIEM in place or uh, file integrity monitoring, or we might be leveraging things like uh, IP, known bad IP addresses. All of this contextual information is somewhat of a, a big data approach that can be put into the analytics engine and have it then see something that's abnormal. And that type of contextual information can be really useful. So this goes beyond just the contextual information of what the user already has in terms of access and goes to what is the user actually doing with his or her access. Uh, in my example here, I have a, a user who has left the organization. Maybe it's a salesperson uh, who retains access to salesforce.com and then is suddenly logging in and, and downloading information uh, useful for their, their new employer. Right? That sort of scenario happens more often than we care to think. And if, if we can have 
a way of flagging that bad behavior or even just abnormal behavior it is going to be really useful for the people who are certifying access. They're, not lo they're no longer looking at lists of you know, 100 users or, or 100 different apps that they have to certify against, but they're really getting the, the, the focus on the things that are the most risky for the organization. So if we click on a button that says Fred's history, we get a, a, some information about what Fred's doing. That's going to help us out. All right, so if we have IGA powered by analytics, we're going to cut down on that rubber stamping problem that I talked about earlier because we're giving line of business users contextual information to make better decisions. Um, it also allows us to be more adaptive because it's taking in real-time information, which has usually been the domain of our security practitioners who are seeing things change in the environment, but bringing that into the identity management world so that we can participate as a, a co-provider of risk reduction for our organizations. So to summarize again, it starts with establishing that identity entitlement catalog, knowing who has access to what, even in complex environments, building it from a maintainable perspective with policies that are reproducible, making it business driven with friendly user interfaces, and then leveraging analytics to really cut down on the volume of information that has to be considered and really focus on what's most impactful. So as you consider where your own maturity might be from a preventive, detective, and corrective control, uh, I thought I'd leave you with a, a few questions you can ask yourself. So, are all your access policies centrally managed and enforced? How are you doing that? Do line of business managers have the context they need in order to make good decisions, or are we just giving them a list of access to certify? Do you use risks, roles, and attributes to define an authorization model that allows management by exception? Uh, we don't, if we can focus on just the things that are exceptions to the rule, that can certainly improve our efficiency. From a detective perspective, do you have a way of reviewing what your users are doing with their access? Right? We, oftentimes we review what access they have, but do we also have a way of reviewing what's happening uh, or what they're actually using their access for? Privilege users, we haven't really talked much about them, but uh, we ought to tie in what's happening in our privileged identity management systems with our identity governance as well, because it, we, again, we can use some of the activity that's identified by privileged access to inform uh, whether that user's access is, uh, is appropriate or not. And can you take immediate action to certify and or revoke access? Uh, we, we, sometimes we refer to this as adaptive certifications. Everybody heard of adaptive authentication? Right, it's the idea of risk-based authentication. It's that idea if, if somebody's doing something risky, we do a step-up authentication. We ask them for another piece of information or maybe even a second factor of authentication. Well, why can't we have adaptive certifications where when somebody is doing something inappropriate with their access, maybe we ask their manager, hey, is this appropriate? Is it appropriate for this user to be logging in from a cafe in Thailand? Maybe it is. Maybe, maybe that user is on the road and, and it's appropriate. But it's, it's another way that we can interact uh, to, to reduce risk. And finally, from a corrective perspective is, you know, what are your revocation rates? Are you measuring those? What is, let me ask you this question. What is an appropriate revocation rate? Anybody want to guess? After an access certification. 100%. 100%. Every, nobody has access, 100%. <laughs> That would make our lives easier, I suppose. Is 1% a good rate? Is 20%, 10%? The reality is that there's, there's no right answer to that question. It, it really depends upon what's happening in your organization. The first time you run certifications, yes, we would expect to have a pretty high rate of revocation because if we haven't been governing access, then of course it's gonna look um, like we have way too much access out there and hopefully we revoke that the first time through. But then on the next iteration of that, we should see a smaller number. But it might spike, again, based on the, the particular environment that the business is operating in. Do we revoke access in a timely manner whenever we uh, see abuse of privileges, especially for privileged users, or over-credentialing is detected? And is it performed consistently through the environment? Uh, I think that's, that's the big question. If we want 
identity governance and administration to be viewed as a security control, it means that we have to be very consistent in how we revoke access and that the process for that is just as well built as our processes for performing the certifications in the first place. Because again, we can do certifications all day long, but they really don't matter if we, if we don't actually revoke any access as a result of that. All right, so that's the conclusion of my prepared remarks. Uh, I will say that uh, our booth's right outside the door, and, and if, if you're interested in understanding more, uh, I'll be there and, and would be happy to take questions from you there. I do believe we might have a few minutes yet if anyone has uh, questions that we can take up here. And um, with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your attendance and attention. We can do some Q&A for the whole room, if you'd like. Uh, of course, you're welcome to, uh, to move on to lunch, too. Hi, I'm interested in um, the analytics. And you talked about how anal analytics can be used to improve the business awareness of um, authorization to access to systems and so on. Um, I guess my question is, uh, if you've got data that's being collected, then you can pick out reports that say, hang hey, on a minute, someone's access looks a bit suspicious, maybe we should revoke that. But what about when you're granting access to somebody new, you haven't got any data collected? So h how do you kind of address new systems being introduced, new users where you haven't got that data and yet you still want to kind of proactively address those risks? Right, so the question is, you know, analytics doesn't, isn't really effective immediately. It has, to, it has to learn that baseline of normalcy. What is normal behavior? And of course, it also begs the question, uh, if the system's already been compromised and is behaving in ways that are risky uh, and it sees that as normal, then you, know, you also have a problem. So you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that every technology here, whether it's multi-factor authentication or whatever, has loopholes in it and has challenges. So that's the concept of applying multiple controls and, and different ways of looking at it is going to be critical. But yeah, it could take you know, several weeks before the machine learning has enough data to, to say, yes, this, this is an appropriate use of that particular credential and, and then flag something that's abnormal. You just have to accept that. Hello there. Um, my question relates to integration. You mentioned ServiceNow, you mentioned Remedy. Um, does your product or is it applicable to have integrations such that if inappropriate access or something that just knocks over into alert, it generates a ticket on the service desk? Well, you certainly could establish that sort of methodology. We, you know, we, uh, we have a SIM platform. Many of you probably already have SIM in place. Um, so that the question of how, where do you want to build those integrations and how do you want to forward events and, and interact with them is very flexible. Uh, so it sort of depends upon what your, your processes are and, and how you see that. But yes, you could, you could leverage analytics that's processing information from other security monitoring tools. And so we have a security monitor or a security analytics approach as well as an identity analytics approach. Uh, Gartner tends to look at those as like two different domains and from our perspective that doesn't make sense. We, we have a, a, a similar team building analytics for, for both of those products, but again it's baked in. It's not like a separate analytics engine that you buy. Uh, but it's sharing information, and then what you do with that information, you, you have a, a pretty broad capability of, of using that to do either you know, an adaptive certification, you might open a ticket, uh, you might flag an alert within SEAM and, and elevate a, a risk score in there. There's, there's a lot of things that you can do with that. Hi, um, just leading on from the question about ServiceNow, so that, there's a couple of people today have mentioned using ServiceNow as a request mechanism for, for all the user access, but on the other hand, seem to still reference the likes of SailPoint as a mechanism to do um, quarterly user entitlement. Are you, are you seeing that kind of cross industry, that there's a yeah. growing use of that? And, and, and one, one of my questions specifically is around 
And one of the challenges we've had about using different systems is, is how you maintain those systems when, when the, the people who are requesting access to resources or groups, that's the same thing you're doing use entitlements on. So having different systems in play causes, causes challenges and just wondering what your views are on that. Yeah, it's, it's a, a great observation. It's one that we've observed too, is you, know, you sort of, to have table stakes to play in this particular uh, marketplace, you have to have your own requests and approval and certification systems, but there's definitely a trend towards organizations who prefer to consolidate that around a ticketing system because their end users are confused by having to go to a ticketing system for certain things and then go to a, you know, an identity and access request system for something else. And so there's, there's definitely a trend towards just putting it all into one interface and then having that integration happen on the back end, it's more transparent for users. So we, we're not gonna tell you what's, what's best for you, you decide, um, but we, we can support both methodologies. Okay, thanks. And, and have, you, have you seen anyone actually use one system to do the entire intent from request to approval to identity to use entitlement? Yeah, in fact, that's, that's, uh, that's definitely the trend that we're seeing. And it's larger organizations that are, and what's interesting is that um, ServiceNow seems to be the, uh, I don't know if there's anybody here that's big fans of Remedy or something else, but uh, that, that's the, the, the mindset of those who are using ServiceNow tend to be ones that, that push that a little bit faster. At least that's been my observation. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello, follow-on question, uh, actually, about the, the service now versus native request GUI. Typically, in the IM solutions, um, things like SOD policy enforcement, entitlement enrichment, a whole range of identity-specific benefits are woven into the user experience. So when I request something that's a policy exception or an SOD, it's going to highlight that to me. How do those kind of things play through to a more generic uh, ITIL request system like ServiceNow, do you lose some of those benefits by relying on a ServiceNow versus using native? Well, you know, a system like ServiceNow or Remedy, um, you know, they've, they've built a lot of ITIL specific capabilities into them already. Um, I don't know, if there was a specific feature that was missing, I'd, I'd, I'd be curious to hear kind of what your observations are. Um, the, I haven't heard that as a concern, but it is an interesting one. Um, I'm trying to think in terms of like maybe incident response or something like that. Like uh, as we as we implement uh, a response to a security incident, then we, we might want to also have that uh, flow into our controls here from an identity perspective. So how how would that relate? It, it, it's not a question that I think I've I've heard before, but um, I'd love to hear more if anybody has some specific concerns around that. So a specific example being requesting a piece of access that the identity solution recognizes would create the second half of an SOD conflict, for example. So I already have uh, A, I'm requesting B, and the solution at request time is going to tell me you can't have B because you've right. already got A. Does ServiceNow have that deep integration that allows that to be put so at the front of the request? I, I understand now. Um, so the, in that scenario where you had a, a separation of duty conflict, I, I don't believe ServiceNow would, would be the place that you would put that information. I, I'm certain you could bend it into that shape, but the reality, and, and the ServiceNow people would love to tell you that, sure, we can do that. Um, but if you, if you talk to the analyst, um, from what I've heard, they they definitely discourage trying to build sort of identity policy into your ticketing system. That the best approach is, is an integration approach and make and use policies within the tools that were built to do that, which is your identity management systems, uh, hopefully not accused, but whatever system you're using, uh, build your policies there. And then when the request comes through from the ticketing system, that's where it would get flagged and rejected. Thanks. Uh, hi, um, I'm intrigued about sheep and fire engines. <laughs> <laughs> Just in, in terms of how are they sort of treated within your, um, your your sort of products? Are they sort of treated as as an identity or as a uh, as an asset? Is it always sort of being used as an asset management system as well? I'm, 
I'm just curious as to how they sort of fit in with the services that they can provide. Right, so uh, more about the, the sheeps and fire engine. Um, the, the thing of it is, is that our, when we built, this goes back to like 1991 when we built the first identity vault. And it was, it was pretty visionary for the team that did that to include a very rich ability to capture attributes. And so the, the users that, that took it upon themselves to give identity to sheeps or, or things um, did so because they wanted to take advantage of the fact that I could say, you know, this particular uh, animal is this, this age, it, is, uh, it goes to pasture during these times, uh, it's, it was last sheared at this time sort of thing. Like these are all attributes that we can store in that system. There's a lot of other vendors that rely on Active Directory as their identity vault. And by doing so, you can, you can go a long way, but you, you definitely aren't capable of, of handling the sort of attributes that, that our approach does. And so we believe that that provides a really interesting ability to expand the concept of identity into especially the identity of things. So where does that thing live? What networks does it communicate on? How does it encrypt its traffic? And so on. You, you can by including that in a, a meta directory approach, it, it actually is very scalable and is, it means that you don't have to, you, you may very well want to have a, a parallel asset system and integrate those things. But uh, by applying policy, you could take the same identity policies and, and, and adjust them to attributes that are stored within the identity vault and, and now you can really take advantage of that. There's a, there's a unique power there, I believe. Thank you. Hello. So, isn't it more regarding chips? Isn't it more um, a customer relationship management system that should be used? For that, so we're talking about identity and attributes. So what is then the borderline between identity management and um, customer management? Mm. There is in certain situations, and I've been facing projects, uh, that there is a very thin borderline. And people, business side, are extremely confused about that difference and how do they understand which one is the right one to use. So question about borderline between identity management and customer. Yeah, I, I think the sheep would probably be happy to hear that they're customers. Um, they're, uh, no, I had to say that in jest. The, the choice of what platform is appropriate for that, is it, is it an asset system? Is it um, something that should be used uh, for something that's very specific to an identity of things? I, I think it's going to de depend upon each environment. Uh, where, where we see identity perhaps playing a role is related to these sort of security controls and the risk around them and the policies around them. So if, uh, if, if we have things that are communicating sensitive information and we have policies around who can access those things, then we start to think in terms of an identity and access management system, if that's what's most important. If tracking the asset and the, the financials around that and uh, understanding what loss might occur and that sort of thing, if that's more important, then sure. I mean, it's probably more of an asset system or some si so, sort of an ERP type of system in that case. But if the focus is on who can access this thing and I want to manage the, the, and mitigate the risk around accessing that thing, uh, then of course identity, access, and policy uh, around that it becomes more important. Sorry, it was a bit of a long walk there. Um, you mentioned, so stage one, understand your catalog, be able to have complete visibility of your estate. Kind of second guessing the product in terms of net IQ. Um, is Identity Manager tightly integrated with the access review stuff? Um, or it, by definition, do your resources need to be managed 
to be able to do that, that kind of visibility, build that catalog, or can you have resources that aren't necessarily managed sure. to, uh, to be able to build that view? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So he's using some uh, product names. So um, I apologize that I'll, I'll just um, kind of go into the, some of the product specifics. But there are, um, in, in our portfolio, there's a product called Identity Manager, which includes the Identity Vault and handles lifecycle management and policy and that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's a product called Access Review, which is focused on the, the governance and certification level. Um, and some of you may know that we had a relationship uh, with SailPoint for some time. But uh, we, we are kind of blazing our own trail now, and Access Review is now our official governance and certification product. So, the, of course, the integrations are there. And the question really was, do you, is, do you need Identity Manager in place with its, all of its you know, identi sources of identity and attributes and that sort of yep. thing in order for Access Review to work as a governance and certification product? And the answer is no. Access Review is a completely independent and competitive uh, product for access governance and, and certification and, and handles many of the same governance and certification use cases that a product like SailPoint Identity IQ would as well. Are they more powerful together? Absolutely. And uh, we would certainly recommend the use of those together. But uh, you, you can get a lot of value from, if, if certification is just your, your primary focus, uh, it's actually a very... Um, a very targeted product and one that, that will produce some pretty quick return on, uh, to, on value uh, whenever you, you, you're focused on that certification use case in particular. Okay, thank you. Can I have a second question? Sure. The, we're talking about service now and obviously the, the fact that it's a complementary kind of product in terms of request fulfillment and, um, and so on. One of the jobs of service now is clearly it's got a powerful workflow engine and you can build those workflows. Um, based on attributes that are stored against objects within ServiceNow. How does that work in terms of certification? So would you see those workflows still appearing in ServiceNow and then having uh, access review doing some of the certification as well? Or are the rules created in your product and then kind of represented in ServiceNow? How does the integration work in that sense? Yeah, there's, there's all this interest in, and ServiceNow is pushing some of yeah. this, right? So if, you, if you're a customer of ServiceNow, they're probably encouraging you to use the workflows and the, to build more out there. Uh, and, you know, certainly there's other workflow products too that you could take a look at. And you, you can sort of roll your own uh, if you really want to take that on. I think there's an inherent risk regardless of what product you do this with, which is if you build it yourself, then you have to maintain it yourself. And things change, and integrations are critical oftentimes, and um, it's, it's going to be on you to, to maintain that over time if you choose to do so. Um, there's, um, you might be able to, to build something that's world class, but why not take advantage of something that's already been built, that's, that's built for purpose for, for that particular thing is our question. But don't take my word for it again. Uh, if, if you have an account with, with Forrester or Gartner, I'd suggest you, you ask that question of them. And that I'm absolutely positive based on seeing them present at conferences that they will advise you against using ServiceNow for some extensive uh, automation as it relates to access certifications or, or even access requests and approval. That, that the best, your, your best option is going to be to use IAM and ServiceNow in concerts each doing what, what the other one does best. Okay, thank you. All right, you guys have asked great questions. I appreciate the attention and uh, hope you enjoy your lunch. <laughs>